Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Provident and Executive Vice Chancellor Ralph Hexter, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth and final event in the 2017-18 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. The UC Davis Forums was established in 2012 and presents about a half dozen lectures each academic year by experts from a range of disciplines. The series was designed to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving with an ultimate goal of helping to produce a public university that will best serve society and individuals, this series poses the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? This season, we've had a series of presentations on quite a range of topics. How to grow diversity and promote success for underrepresented minority students in the STEM disciplines. How universities have differently affected the development of three California regions. The need for complaint to battle sexism. How American universities continue to sustain racism. And how America's community college function as powerful engines for economic and social mobility. Today's forum will continue our exploration of higher education and social mobility. We're privileged to welcome Emmanuel Saez, Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Equitable Growth at UC Berkeley. Professor Saez will speak on the topic, Colleges and Intergenerational Income Mobility in America. Professor Saez will get a proper introduction shortly, but before that, I have a few thank yous and announcements. First, I'd like to thank all of you who've made the event possible. First and foremost, Professor Saez for journeying to our campus from distant Berkeley to share his knowledge and expertise today. Next, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee led by Martin Kenny, Professor of Human and Community Development, and also our moderator for this event, Scott Carroll, Professor of Economics. Finally, I want to acknowledge the campus units that have joined my office to sponsor the le this lecture, the Department of Economics, the Community and Regional Development Program, and the Center for Regional Change. We're currently finalizing our offers, offerings for the UC Davis Foreman's 2018-19 season. Beginning this summer, information on those events will be accessible on our series website at forums.ucdavis.edu and notices and publicity will appear throughout the academic year. Meanwhile, as always, the website gives you access to our video archive of past forums. One more announcement, after today's forums, there will be a question and answer period and then a reception just outside on the patio. We hope that you'll stay for further discussion and refreshments. And now, Professor Carroll. Thank you for being here. Um, it's great pleasure for me to introduce Emmanuel Saez, a professor of economics and director of the Center for Equitable Growth at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on tax policy and inequality from both a theoretical and empirical perspectives. He's one of the most productive and highly cited economists in our profession worldwide with over 29,000 Google Scholar citations and a ranking um, among the best of public economists in the world. Among his many contributions, he has constructed long-run historical series of income inequality data in the United States that have been cited and discussed uh, in the public debate. So a little bit about, about Emmanuel. He received his PhD in economics from MIT in 1999. Among the numerous awards that he's received include the 2009 John Bates Clark Medal, which is awarded to the American economist under the age of 40, who is judged to have made the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. And because he's a dual citizen uh, with American and, and France, he also won the 2010 uh, award for the best young economist in France. <laughs> I will say that the United States uh, gave him the American award one year before France did, so they followed our lead. Uh, in addition, he's been the recipient of a Mar MacArthur Fellowship, NSF Career Grant, and two Alfred P. Sloan Fellowships. So finally, on a more personal note, I can say that Emmanuel is one of the most genuine and gracious uh, superstars in our profession. 
I still recall after that being after I was hired at UC Davis in 2007, he quickly invited me down to uh, Berkeley to give a talk. And the first thing he did was pull me in my office and gave me advice on how to make tenure at Davis. And he may or may not remember this, but the first thing he said to me is, work on the project that is closest to being published. And I guess because I'm still standing here, that advice did in fact work. And I give that same advice with credit to Emmanuel to every student and junior faculty member that I meet uh, to this day. So it's with great pleasure uh, that we have Emmanuel Saez. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Scott, for this uh, introduction. So it's a great pleasure to be uh, here uh, this afternoon to talk about the role of colleges in intergenerational uh, mobility. So let me uh, get started and introduce uh, the topic so, uh, of inequality and opportunity in America. So income inequality in America is very high and growing. And indeed, a lot of my work has been about documenting trends in income inequality. So today, let me just say that the share of income going to the top 1% has doubled from 10%, that's the series in red, in the 1970s up to over 20% today. At the same time, the share of income going to the bottom 50%, so the poorest half of the population, has done exactly the reverse trend, going down from over 20% to about 12%. Uh, so inequality is a, a growing issue. The second thing uh, is that we know that also that children from low-income families are much less likely to succeed uh, economically. Uh, so for example, a simple statistic is that if you are born uh, and grow up in a family from the bottom 20%, in the US, your chances as an adult to reach the 20%, the top 20%, will be only 7.5%. So much less than the 20% chance you would have, you know, if parental income didn't matter. Perhaps more striking is that actually that probability is significantly less than in other advanced uh, economies. It is over 13% in Canada, our neighbor to the north or around you know, 12% in a Scandinavian country like Denmark. So in other words, the American dream, the fact that you can succeed starting from nothing, seems actually to be truer in Canada or Denmark than in the United States uh, uh, today. And so combine those two things, you know, the fact that your parental income situation matters a lot for your economic success, where you will end up in the distribution, and the fact that inequality is now very wide, you understand that the stakes of being bored you know, in the right uh, family are extremely uh, important. So what we are going to uh, do today is uh, to look at one aspect of intergenerational mobility, which is the role of higher education. That is, uh, does college you know, perpetuate inequality, or is it an opportunity, you know, uh, 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 an opportunity for low-income uh, 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 children. So the first, so so I, one thing I should have said is that uh, this talk here will be based on a paper uh, we wrote about a year ago with a team of researchers, including uh, Rash Chetty at Stanford, John Friedman at Brown, uh, Danny Yagan, my colleague at Berkeley, and Nicholas Turner at Treasury, who helped us get access actually to the incredible data uh, we were able. Uh, to use. And so the first thing I want to uh, point out is that there is a huge discrepancy in college attendance by uh, family income. And so let me uh, show you that uh, chart that ranks uh, uh, kids by, uh, 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 by uh, the parent income percentile. So at zero, you have the poorest kids, and at 100, the richest kids uh, in, uh, in the US. And the y-axis shows you for each percentile what's the likelihood uh, that you are going to attend any college by age uh, 22. And you can see that it's a sharply upward sloping uh, uh, line where your chances of attending college are almost 100%, 95% if you are from uh, high income families, but it's only about 30% at the bottom 
of uh, the distribution. So it's obvious that college is one aspect that's going to play a key role in understanding uh, intergenerational uh, mobility. So what we do uh, in this paper is that we use systematic data uh, to see how colleges shape upward uh, mobility. And so we are going to use uh, systematic data to calculate statistics on parent incomes and student earnings uh, uh, outcomes at each colleges. And I'll show you some numbers actually with, for UC Davis, comparing UC Davis to other uh, institutions. And so this is based on systematic uh, data where we combine tax data that give you information on parents' income, child income when they are adults, and also the child attendance of college as uh, the tax system needs to administer uh, credits for universities, the forms, you know, 10, uh, 90, uh, 98, that we combined also with Pell Grant records uh, 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 from the Department of Education so that we cover uh, the universe of all kids and in particular, you know, all college uh, goers. Okay, so uh, the, and one important thing I, I should point out is that we're not going in this work to identify the causal effect uh, or value added of attending a specific college. Those will be descriptive statistics, but I believe that just from seeing descriptive statistics, it raises a lot of questions, it generates, you know, feelings and fosters uh, the, the, the public policy debate, and I look forward uh, uh, to hearing, you know, your, your comments, knowing that others, including, you know, Scott and other colleagues then study hard, you know, what are the causal effects of attending uh, colleges, but both are, are useful. And in particular, uh, we are going to uh, uh, show you, you know, uh, which colleges do the best, you know, in promoting uh, 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 income mobility. That is getting a lot of low income students and pushing them up uh, towards the top of the uh, 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 distribution. And we'll see there that actually certain colleges, you know, good public schools play a key role uh, in this. So, uh, here is how the outline will proceed. I will first show you some statistics on the parents' income distribution, then move on to students' uh, outcomes, and then study systematically uh, differences in mobility rates across colleges, and finally show you some uh, trends, what has happened you know, over the last uh, 15 uh, years. So in terms of uh, parental income distributions, so the way uh, we measure things is that Parent income here means, you know, the average pre-tax parental income uh, over a five-year period when the child was a teenager, but roughly speaking from 15 to 19, that's going to proxy the resources that the family has at the time the kid is in high school and thinking about going uh, to uh, college. And we are always going to focus on percentile ranks where parents are ranked relative to other parents with children in the same birth cohort. So to, just to show you how it looks like, this is the density distribution of parental uh, income showing you, you know, in vertical bars, key percentiles. So if you, take, if you look at all kids born in the 1980 uh, cohorts, the average income when the kid was 15 to uh, uh, 19 expressed in today's dollars looks like this. That is, uh, the 20th percentile is $25,000. The median is $60,000. Uh, 80th percentile, you know, is 110. And top 1% uh, uh, threshold is about 500K. So just to uh, make it concrete, the bottom 20%, you know, an income of $25,000 for a family with at least uh, one child, that's somewhat but not that much more above, you know, the poverty uh, line. The median, half the families have $60,000 uh, or less, and half uh, will have more than $60,000. P80, 110, think about that as the threshold, you know, to get you, you know, in the upper uh, middle class, that's certainly not the rich. The rich are more, you know, 500K. Yes, there you, we, we can start thinking about these uh, families as uh, really uh, rich. Okay, so what is uh, the distribution of uh, kids by parent income quintile? 
in uh, an elite school in California, you know, Stanford uh, uh, University. And so what you can see is that the distribution is uh, extremely uh, skewed. Actually, at Stanford University, 69% uh, of kids actually come from uh, families from the top 20%. And actually, uh, in that big bar, actually 14% come from the top 1%. So the top 1% is 14 times overrepresented at Stanford University. It's a striking number because it shows you that if you add the first three bars, kids coming from the bottom 60%, it's only slightly above uh, the number of kids coming from the top uh, one uh, percent. So indeed, you know, when we look at our data, we find that more students from the top, there are more students from the top one percent than the bottom 50 percent at the Ivy Plus colleges, or what we call the very elite, you know, the Ivy Leagues, plus Stanford, Chicago, MIT, uh, and Duke. So certainly there is a lot of inequality in uh, elite uh, college attendance. Uh, so let me compare Harvard University, which is the numbers you've already seen, to other schools. So now if you look at a flagship uh, public school uh, like UC Berkeley, you can see that there is less uh, segregation. You know, it's less uh, lopsided towards the top, but it's still a pretty skewed uh, distribution that is even at UC Berkeley, about 50% of kids come from the top uh, 20%. And way less than 20%, you know, from the bottom three quintiles. So I'll show you UC Davis afterwards, but UC Davis is actually very similar to UC uh, Berkeley along, uh, along that statistic. Now, if you take um, a public school in New York, Stony Brook is striking. It has a lot more even uh, distribution, so it's only slightly slanted towards uh, the top 20% uh, 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 while being still a pretty, good, a pretty good school. And finally, if you look at a community college uh, in Glendale Community College, that is a, a community college that does very well on outcomes, uh, it's close to, it's in the LA uh, region. There you see that the community college takes relatively more kids from the bottom 20%, you know, that is the distribution here is, uh, uh, is declining. So now, we know uh, that uh, there is a lot of income segregation across uh, colleges, but yet uh, residence is also very uh, segregated in the United States in the sense that rich kids tend to uh, live in uh, places where there are other rich kids and therefore go to school, high school, you know, uh, uh, with uh, peers. It turns out that the segregation in college and before college is actually quite comparable. So that's one statistic you can see here. If you look at the bottom 20% kids, uh, what are their peers in residence before college and during college? And what you can see is that in residence, they live with about 29% uh, 29 of the families uh, uh, of, of, of families with kids their age will come from the bottom 20%. So the bottom 20% is overrepresented in their neighborhood, pretty much the same way it is overrepresented in uh, college. And they have only 12, about 12% 12 of their peers before college or in college that come from the top 20%. But you can see that the segregation is pretty much the same. And the same is true in reverse for the top 20% kids, that this time, you know, they live more with uh, kids coming from the top 20% and much less so with kids coming from the bottom 20%. Now, if I look uh, at the top 1% kids who happen to attend these Ivy Plus elite colleges, you can see that uh, it is uh, very skewed. So actually the colors are not uh, super visible, but in terms of attending college, it's about 65%, you know, from the top 20% and 15% from the top 1%. So that's the huge segregation in colleges. But you can see that actually uh, segregation in residence is even, before college, is even uh, more skewed and astonishing. 30% uh, of their Kids' peers also come from the top 
1%. So even though we might think that uh, Stanford produces an extreme income segregation, it, it actually provides an environment that is more diverse uh, to the rich kids than what they had before college. Okay? Uh, now, let me uh, move on to uh, student earnings uh, distribution. So we are going to uh, measure children's uh, individual earnings in their mid-30s. Uh, and again, we're going to define uh, percentile ranks by ranking children relative to others in the, in the same uh, birth cohorts. And so in contrast to parents where we looked at family income, here we are going to look at individual earnings, which means only uh, labor income, so that we don't look at capital income that might be affected by how wealthy your family uh, was, etc. It's just what you earn from working, wage earnings plus self-employment uh, income, and only your own earnings, disregarding you know, your spousal earnings if you are uh, married. Okay? And so what we uh, first find, and let me go fast on that, is that looking at individual earnings in their mid-30s, which is the best we can do given how much data we have, is actually pretty good because earnings ranks stabilize around age 30, even at top colleges. When you compare kids relative to their cohorts, how well the Harvard kids do relative to others is about stabilized by age 30 when you've completed your higher education, PhD uh, 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 degree, and you've started, typically started your uh, career. Okay, so for kids, incomes are a lot lower because those are younger kids. So just to give you uh, perspective, the median is only 28K. Uh, by their mid-30s, the average earnings in today's dollars of kids, you know, US-wide, born in 1980, is 28,000. P80, which will be a measure of success, you know, getting to the top 20%, it's a pretty good job paying 58K, but it's not a huge uh, amount uh, for adults, you know, or professors here in this uh, 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 in this room, even assistant professors. Uh, P99 starts looking like real uh, success, like making uh, an individual earnings of 200, uh, 200K. And about the bottom 20% is only 1K, 1,000, because a significant fraction of those children actually don't work and have uh, zeros, okay? So now, for universities, uh, we can present uh, uh, what we call mobility report cards uh, that way. So the, the bars are what you've already seen about percent of students coming from each parent income quintile. And here uh, the series shows you something about children's outcomes, which is the percentage of students who reach the top quintile. That is, get a job paying at least 60 thousand uh, dollars for each of those groups. And so what you can see is that indeed Stanford is a good school. You go there, you have a significant probability over 60% of getting one of those good jobs. And what is striking in this chart is that you can see that that probability is actually quite uh, stable across parent quintiles. That is, even if you come from a poor background, you get 60% chance, and about the same is true. I mean, you get a little bit more, you know, if you come from a top 20% uh, uh, background, but uh, the difference is actually quite uh, modest. Now, if I look at UC Davis here uh, in blue, you can see that UC Davis has a more equal distribution of parental income, but it's still the case, so it's hard for me to read, but I think the number is in the uh, uh, mid, upper 40s, you know, about the fraction of kids coming from the top uh, 20% at UC Davis. Uh, and the success rate at UC Davis is lower than at Stanford, but it's still pretty good, uh, being over 50% chance of getting uh, to the top 20%, you know, by your uh, 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 mid-30s. And it has also that characteristic that it is pretty stable uh, uh, across uh, 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 quintiles. So in other words, so that's here in the case of two schools, but we find that much more um, systematically. Once you control for the college you attend, the role of parental income, it's much diminished. Okay? So in other words, the key to success goes through 
uh, college. That's a, that's a simple way of uh, 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 summarizing it, and that's why who attends which college is so important, you know, for what happens, you know, to uh, intergenerational uh, mobility. So now, uh, okay, Stanford does better than UC Davis, but look at the comparison of UC Davis versus Brown. It is a, a, a striking comparison because uh, Brown draws kids mostly from the top. Uh, like Stanford does, and yet in terms of outcome, it is actually quite similar to uh, UC Davis. So just with this uh, simple example, you can see that Davis is more, contributes more, you know, to upward mobility than Stanford because it takes a lot more kids from the bottom and manages to push them to uh, the top uh, 20%. And so the, the way we are going to measure uh, 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 the mobility uh, rate of a college is precisely to take that product. What fraction of your student body comes from the bottom 20%, so poor kids, multiplied by the likelihood of those poor kids getting to the top 20%. So in other words, uh, the product of those two things uh, tells you the fraction of your student body that's poor, poor background, but succeeds to uh, reaching uh, the top uh, 20%, okay? And so, uh, now, if I compare uh, UC Davis to UC Berkeley, as I told you, you know, the distribution of parental income are actually very, very close across the two uh, schools, and Berkeley does slightly better in terms uh, of outcome. It's intermediate between Stanford, you know, and uh, UC Davis. So in that sense, Berkeley takes about the same number of kids from the bottom 20% and pushes a little bit uh, 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 more of them into uh, the top uh, 20%. So uh, uh, let, me, let me skip. Okay, no, so this one is actually pretty important. So one way to represent uh, intergenerational mobility is to, again, align kids by the percentile of their, of, the, of their parents' income. And then for each percentile, ask the question, uh, what is uh, the rank, the percentile rank that the child achieves on average? What you can see here is that there is a steep slope. That is, if you start from really low-income families, your average rank will be in the mid-upper 30s. Well, if you start you know, from high-income families, uh, your uh, percentage rank will be in the high uh, 60s. So actually, there is a 30-point difference uh, in terms of your average rank if you start rich versus poor. So that's the value of being born in a high-income family. Now, if I redo this graph, controlling for college. That is comparing rich kids and poor kids, but uh, for kids who go to the same college, I get a much lower uh, slope uh, here, where the uh, disadvantage of being poor is actually less, is about 10 points instead of being 30 points when you don't control for uh, 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 college. So that's a way of summarizing, you know, all the data showing you how important uh, college is in terms of uh, creating, you know, that uh, uh, intergenerational uh, persistence. There is intergenerational persistence because uh, high-income kids are much more likely, you know, to go to college and to, go to the good uh, colleges, and that gives you a big boost in your likelihood of having uh, high uh, earnings. Okay. So uh, let me uh, 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 continue and, and start talking about differences in mobility uh, rates across uh, colleges. So uh, here, so we, we, we've combined data, as I've shown you, you know, on parents' income and students' outcomes. And so we define, you know, this mobility rate, as I've uh, told you before, as the fraction of your student body that comes from a poor background at what we call access, times uh, the fraction of those students that you can put into the top 20%. So at UC Davis, it's about 5%. So that meaning on, on campus here, 5% of the student body comes from a disadvantaged background and will succeed 
uh, in reaching the top 20%, you know, in, uh, 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 when they are in the 30s. So that's a much better number than Brown University that has a very similar success rate, but takes only 3% of its student body, you know, from the bottom uh, 20%. Uh, so with this simple statistic, you know, you can represent uh, this in a chart where here on the y-axis, I have access defined as percent of parents uh, in bottom quintile in your student body with Davis, you know, doing substantially better than Brown. And on the y-axis, I have what we call the success rate, the likelihood that the kid will get to the top 20% conditional on starting, you know, from parents in the top, uh, 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 in the bottom 20% uh, and you can see that here Brown and UC Davis are pretty well aligned. But you, you can do the cloud of all the higher uh, institutions, uh, higher education institutions in the United States. And so what you can see is that it's a big cloud and what you want for intergenerational mobility is to be in that direction. You want a big number, lots of kids, uh, from poor backgrounds and lots of success. That is, an ability to put a lot of those kids uh, in the top. And so there are some schools that are doing pretty well in this cloud, and you have schools that do actually quite poorly, that they neither take a lot of kids from the bottom 20% and they don't have uh, great uh, success. So you can have uh, the isoquant that tells you, you know, uh, a given level of success that is where the product of the two things uh, uh, is constant and here the median is 1.6 percent meaning that half the institutions weighted by enrollment you know are above and half are below that is on average in the US uh, an institute uh, higher education a university or a college will have only 1.6 percent of their kids from the bottom 20 percent and able to put them uh, uh, in the top 20%. So you can see that Brown is right at the median. UC Davis does uh, a lot better. Actually, UC Davis is even in the top, better than the top 10%. So it's the 19th percentile for those higher education institutions is 3.5%. Now, UC Davis, though, uh, yes, yeah, so you, you can also see that UC Davis does pretty well relative to uh, all the Ivy League uh, schools in the sense that it has much better access uh, than any of them, even though uh, it has typically less success than the best ones, you know, uh, like Princeton, MIT, and like Brown and better, you know, than Duke or uh, University of uh, Chicago. But because it has so much better access, it has a mobility rate much higher than uh, those schools. In terms of the flagship uh, public university, uh, four-year institutions. Uh, UC Davis also does very well. Really, in this graph, you can see really only Berkeley does better, you know, uh, in terms of success and, and, and access. The other schools tend to be uh, 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 not, not quite uh, as good. Uh, so now, UC Davis is not, is in the top 10%, but is not one of the 10 best uh, institutions. So if you look at the schools that have the highest uh, mobility rate, meaning the top 10 colleges in America uh, measured by that uh, 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 bottom to top quintile mobility rate, you see that the, uh, the schools in the top 10 tend typically to be either uh, community colleges or four-year non-elite institutions that typically have a very high fraction of their student body from the bottom 20% and yet have relatively good outcomes. They can place a substantial fraction of them into uh, the top uh, 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 20%. So UC Davis has a very good number uh, relative to Ivy Plus colleges or the average college in the US, but uh, 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 wouldn't be, you know, in the in the very top, uh, in the very top uh, ten. Um, okay. So now, next, uh, I want to uh, look at how uh, the character. What can we say about the characteristics of those high mobility rate uh, colleges? That is, how can we? Uh, are there systematic differences between colleges with high 
versus low mobility rates. And so we are going to examine some correlation uh, with uh, various uh, uh, college characteristics, you know, that comes from uh, the IPEDS, which is the big database on all the higher education uh, institutions. And so what, if the first thing I, I want to say is that that variation is not solely due to geography. That is, you might think that perhaps, you know, schools in California do so well because lots of jobs in California pay well, more than $60,000, while perhaps in another uh, state, uh, you know, uh, like in the South, there are very few jobs, you know, uh, paying well, so it's a lot harder. That is actually not true. That is, even within a given metro area, though here in the case of uh, Los Angeles, an enormous metro area, those are all the blue dots are all the schools in the LA uh, area. There is tremendous heterogeneity. That is, you have schools in the LA area that do poorly, you know, in terms of success and access, and then you, are, you have schools uh, that do extremely well, you know, Cal State, uh, Los Angeles being uh, one of the very best, uh, actually, uh, in the country. So it's certainly not a, 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 a geographical uh, location, and actually it's neither uh, whether, uh, uh, you know, your students tend to do, you know, to choose as majors uh, uh, things like STEM or business that are known to give you, you know, good job uh, opportunities. If you actually look at the top decile of mobility rates, that is the schools in the top 10%, that includes UC Davis, they do have a substantial fraction of their students in STEM and business, but really not much more at all than uh, all uh, the uh, other uh, uh, schools. So it's not, you can't pinpoint what are the good schools by just looking at geographical area or uh, the majors uh, 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 that students uh, tend to choose. And it actually, uh, when you look for, this, uh, uh, for those correlations, you find only relatively weak uh, correlations. So here, for each type of uh, characteristics, we measure how that characteristic is correlated with uh, the uh, mobility rate of uh, the school. And so what you can see uh, here is that the correlation is pretty weak, except perhaps for selectivity. Those are correlations you know, in the order 0.2 to 0.4. That is, schools that have high rejection rates uh, tend to be, uh, to be better. But that's about uh, the only characteristics that is strongly, uh, 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 strongly correlated. Average faculty salary is also somewhat uh, 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 correlated. But if you look at expenditures and costs, uh, you don't find much uh, correlation. So what is striking, you know, perhaps from this analysis is that we do see a lot of heterogeneity in those schools, you know, so typically community colleges and uh, four-year non-elite institutions. Some of them are incredibly successful. Others are much uh, uh, much weaker, and it's not obvious based on characteristics to be able to know which one is which. And actually, that fits with what Scott is actually studying, you know, the community college system in uh, California, and is using, you know, in incredible data, administrative data from California. He's been able to verify, indeed, that for community colleges, there is tremendous differences in how much they can transfer uh, students to four-year institutions or, uh, 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 or the UCs. Now, let me, uh, instead of talking about the top 20%, what if we look at, what if we define success as really getting into the top 1%? That is, getting those jobs that pay 200K or more and put you in the top 1% of your cohort uh, US uh, wide. So, in that case, uh, we get. Uh, the following cloud, and what you can see is that is a very actually is a very different story in the sense that the schools that are really able, you know, uh, to do well, that is, place a substantial fraction of their poor kids in the top one percent, are almost exclusively Ivy League type schools. That is, the blue dots uh, 
up there, and all of them, as you can see, uh, they place their poor kids in the top 1% with high likelihood. The problem is that they have very few poor kids uh, to start with. Now, in those schools that have a lot of poor kids, uh, they can't place many of them in the top 1%. Uh, so in that game, actually, you can see that UC Davis is still pretty good. You know, it's above the, the, the top 10% uh, line. The only school that does really well uh, uh, at least in this in this chart is really UC Berkeley that has a good placement in the top one percent and still a decent fraction of kids you know coming uh, uh, from the bottom twenty percent. So now if I redo the top ten, actually UC Berkeley comes first. That is, it has you know something like 075 percent of its student body that is poor and will be able to get one of the top 1% jobs. So it's UC Berkeley then, and then after that, it's pretty much all very wealthy, you know, Ivy League uh, 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 type uh, uh, schools. UC Davis does much, much better along that metric, you know, than the average college in the US, but does not compete, you know, doesn't place nearly as many uh, kids in the top. Uh, in the top 1%. So here, um, if you want, you know, the correlates of uh, uh, mobility with what we call, you know, uh, upper tail uh, success are very clear. You really have uh, to be, you know, one of those Ivy League schools and perhaps a handful of uh, flagship uh, 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 state school uh, universities. And the correlations uh, with the various characteristics are actually much clearer. It's highly correlated with selectivity. You know, those top schools are very selective. That is, they get, they, 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 they admit a very small fraction of their applicants. It's also highly correlated with uh, 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 features such as, you know, average faculty uh, salary, completion rate, and very correlated with uh, instructional cost uh, per uh, uh, student. So if you, if to, 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 to summarize uh, this, uh, uh, these findings here, we find that there are two educational, different educational models for mobility. Uh, the highest rates of top quintile mobility that is getting the good job, you know, of 60K or, or more, are some uh, mid-tier public schools such as Cal State, you know, or the CUNYs, uh, in New York, and here there is tremendous heterogeneity in schools that look, you know, on observable characteristics, pretty similar. And therefore, there is perhaps scope for understanding what is it that the successful schools are doing? Is it mostly, you know, selection of their student body, or are they doing things, you know, the institution themselves work uh, uh, differently? In contrast, for up highest rates of upper tail mobility that is getting into the top uh, 1%, that's really the realm of uh, elite uh, private colleges, which is a model that is difficult actually to, uh, to expand. Uh, uh, there's no uh, easy solution, you know, to duplicate, you know, uh, Stanford on, a, on an industrial uh, scale, uh, which is what, what you would need, you know, if you wanted to, 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 to improve uh, 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 to improve uh, upper uh, tails uh, mobility. So now let me uh, finish by showing you some statistics in trends uh, since uh, 2000. Uh, so here uh, we know that there have been significant policy change in higher education since uh, 2000, and in particular expansions in financial aid and low-income outreach at uh, elite private uh, colleges. Indeed, you know, those elite private colleges, it's part of their uh, public relation uh, work, are not shy, you know, at advertising to the broader public and, and, and politicians that they are doing a lot to take in poor kids by providing, you know, very generous fellowships. If your SAT score is very high and you come from a poor background, Stanford or Harvard is going to give you a full fellowship, so you can come and you don't have uh, to uh, 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 pay. At the same time, uh, public schools have uh, suffered, you know, from budget cuts and tuition 
uh, increases. At the same time, you know, what we say here, you know, in the University of California system is that, yes, our tuition is increasing a lot. You know, we have to. The state is not giving us uh, money, but we are careful to protect the low-income kids. They still get their fellowships, and therefore, they are not affected uh, uh, by the tuition increase. At least at UC Berkeley, that's what we uh, uh, tend to say all the time. Perhaps it's the same message uh, here at UC, at UC uh, Davis. So overall, how, uh, 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 how have these changes you know, affected access? The striking thing for the very elite schools, you know, so take the case of uh, Stanford. If you look at the percent of parents uh, in the bottom quintile, you know, that is fraction of kids coming from the bottom 20% at Stanford, it's low and actually pretty flat, uh, you know, for kids, you know, from when they were attending in 2000 to uh, 11 years uh, later. Uh, same, pretty much the same thing at Harvard. Perhaps Harvard had the trend up a little bit and then, you know, uh, uh, kind of concerned, but there hasn't been a dramatic change uh, here. So this contrasts with uh, the discourse of those uh, elite institutions that tell you we are doing lots of efforts to take uh, poor kids. They actually often cite a statistic that our fraction of kids with Pell Grants, Pell Grants that you get you know, on a means-tested basis if your family income is low enough, is growing. And that's true, and that's actually consistent with that because uh, Pell Grant uh, 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 now are given, you know, to relatively more kids. In part because inequality has increased so much that there are lots of kids, uh, 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 lots of families that qualify uh, for the Pell uh, the Pell Grant. So they are able to take uh, more kids. So those institutions have more Pell Grants, but if you look at the hard numbers, you know, relative to the bottom 20%, it's actually flat out. So, I mean, we, we can still commend Harvard and Stanford for having tried, you know, to do more to at least maintain those numbers. If they hadn't done anything, probably those numbers would have, uh, would have fallen. Now, let, let's look at UC Davis and uh, UC Berkeley. And actually here, you have to say that UC Davis has been doing better than Berkeley. That is, the two started pretty much the same. And at Berkeley, there has been an erosion. What at UC Davis, uh, the number, if anything, has been going up uh, a little bit. So I don't know uh, whether it's specific policies, outreach, you know, that UC Davis has tried to do. I know that at UC Berkeley, admissions really try to target, you know, some high school that they know come from disadvantaged, in disadvantaged uh, areas and giving, you know, a good chance, you know, to, to, to applicants uh, there. But UC Davis has, has been doing better. Now, what is alarming here is that when we look at the best schools in terms of their uh, mobility rate, we see that those schools are not as good as they used uh, to be. That is, Cal State LA, which was the top school, you know, for uh, uh, high mobility, was taking a lot of poor kids uh, back when we studied them, you know, uh, uh, to know what happened to the kids. But now, in more recent years, that number has gone down uh, a lot. And indeed, uh, an alarming trend uh, that uh, uh, we've seen is that uh, the fraction of kids from low-income families has gone down uh, the most in the schools uh, that were best, you know, in taking a lot of them and placing them uh, at the top. So college attendance for low-income kids has not gone down, but the quality uh, of the institutions they attend, even if it's a community college that there is a tremendous heterogeneity, seems to have uh, come down. And as you know, there has been also the explosion of for-profit schools that have replaced, you know, uh, uh, public schools because states have retrenched, you know, from uh, uh, higher education. That has gone up. And we, we don't yet have the data to look at it. There is uh, for-profit schools in 2000 were pretty good. But I bet that now with all the stories we've seen, uh, those for-profit schools, you know, are no longer nearly uh, as good in the sense that their business model has really changed from providing, you know, specialized education to really trying to 
maximize profits, get the biggest number of students, you know, get all the fellowships they can and student loans uh, they can without caring as much about the quality uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the education. Uh, so let me uh, 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 finish here by telling you a little bit about policy uh, lessons. So low-income students admitted to selective colleges do not appear uh, overplaced based on their earnings outcomes. So that's one of the most important lessons, meaning that currently you look at poor kids you know, going to good schools and they do almost as well as the rich kids going to the same uh, uh, school. That is, the poor kids admitted you know, at Harvard, Stanford, but that's true for the UCs you know, and the flagship uh, uh, schools. Once they are in college, they do seem to succeed economically uh, almost uh, as, as well as their richer uh, peers. And therefore, that provides support you know, for policies that seek uh, to bring more uh, such students to uh, selective uh, colleges. So something that Harvard and Stanford, uh, the Ivy Leagues, has tried to do and they've had some success to at least uh, maintain, but something that we feel uh, would be very important uh, in the public schools because that's where the big numbers of students uh, are. That is for the uh, overall intergenerational mobility in the United States. It's not going to happen through Harvard and Stanford because they take a minuscule numbers uh, of students. It's going to, to happen through uh, the quality of uh, public schools and particularly, you know, the type of schools, the community colleges and four-year institutions that had a really good uh, track record of placing, you know, lots of students in the top 20%. That's where you need to defend access uh, 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 the most if you want to maintain uh, intergenerational uh, 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 mobility. Now, uh, so, 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 Yeah, so, so basically that's what this slide uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is saying. Uh, and so, so, so I invite uh, people you know, to use those data uh, to think creati creatively about how uh, can we uh, improve uh, access to uh, public education. So my view that is perhaps you know, not usually informed you know, relative to experts uh, in this room is that in the end, uh, the level and quality of education in your country is going to be uh, decided by uh, the public resources we put into it. That is, if you look historically at how education has increased in countries over time, it's always been an effort led you know, through uh, government funding. I, I know of no example of a private uh, system that gives us, you know, the big and quality, uh, big numbers and quality for uh, higher education. So at a very high level, uh, that's the, 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 uh, uh, the most important thing. So I mean, one striking illustration of that in the case of the U.S. is the, uh, the GI Bill. With the GI Bill, you know, and lots of veterans after World War II, you see uh, the college uh, uh, completion of men uh, shooting up relative to women because so few women were uh, uh, veterans. So that's a direct evidence, you know, that uh, uh, government, uh, you know, providing, you know, fellowships for uh, veterans uh, plays a huge role. And so in this context, I think it is a very worrisome trend uh, that states across the countries seem to have, uh, you know, reduced uh, their involvement in higher education. So, so even the UC uh, system, you know, is a public school only partly, you know, at UC Berkeley, we also like to say that we only 20% of our uh, resources come from the state. The remaining 80%, you know, comes from uh, other uh, sources, tuitions, you know, grants, etc., like a private school. So it is looking like it is uh, uh, moving towards a, a, a privatized uh, a system that works well for the very elite, but cannot uh, succeed, you know, in providing, you know, quality mass uh, education. So let me leave it at these thoughts, and I'm very happy to take uh, some more questions to, to, to continue this uh, uh, well, first, discussion. before we take questions, I'd like to thank Emmanuel.
And then uh, I, I also wanted to give him a plug. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, uh, all of the data that he presented, you can look up any college in the country to, to see uh, these figures on the New York Times Upshot uh, blog that has provided Yes, that. no, it's true. There is the New York Times uh, has played, you know, with our data, but we also have a, a website where you can download, you know, a, a Stata format, you know, for those of you who are uh, economists and play with the data and create very quickly, yeah. you know, the graphs we... And an unintended sure. benefit of your work is that I often use uh, these data when I meet with prospective student athletes to recruit them against other uh, competitive institutions given we do so well. <laughs> so I have a microphone here. We're going to open it up for questions and we'll pass the microphone around. You have one in the back? Hi, thank you much for your presentation. I had a question because you talked about how geography doesn't seem to play a role in your findings, but thinking about geography, we know that $60,000 coming out of Davis and where those graduates may live makes a difference compared to $60,000 coming into the Bay Area after graduating from Berkeley. So have you played with that type of look or looked at yes. where these students are going? Yeah, so, so I mean, th th that's a good question. So what is true is that, yes, 60, here is 60K, 60K, wherever you are, Mississippi or the uh, Bay Area, when in reality the purchasing power, you know, is not the same in the, in the two places. So we've redone our statistics, you know, by measuring income, deflating income by the local price index, you know, and it doesn't affect that much actually uh, the the ranking you know of the of the of the universities but that's that's a very good point in terms of uh, where the students are and where they go I, I think that raises an interesting question in the sense that right now in the US our funding of higher education is mostly state level and uh, states are going to be very unequal in their ability to retain their smartest uh, students. So take a state, you know, that doesn't have a big uh, city. So states, you know, um, in, the, in the Middle West or more rural states, they might have a very good uh, university. So Michigan is, is, is a good example. They have big cities, but they don't have thriving uh, big cities. University of Michigan does very well but a lot of the best success, you know, the top 20% kids, you know, coming out of Michigan to migrate out of Michigan. And California, in, in, in contrast, is able, you know, to attract uh, graduates, you know, from, uh, uh, from other states. So I think that raises a true question, you know, when, so when you have migration problems like this, it tells you that you would want, you know, the federal government to provide, you know, at least a base uh, a base funding because a state like Michigan might think, you know, it's not worth for me to invest in higher education if our best kids uh, uh, move to, uh, to, to other states. Hi. Um, in, in arriving at the coefficient you use to show success, or several of them, um, to indicate that a college is doing well in in, uh, um, in ushering their students toward success rates, using that 20% um, uh, seems kind of strange to me, given, given I, all the work I know that you do, in that um, your, uh, uh, it seems to me that, that shooting the moon, hitting the 20%, that, that kind of inequality that allows for that echelon of people is not really healthy for our society, right? Um, am I getting that right? That I mean, am I fairly characterizing the inequality that that 20% represents? It was interesting to me that um, it scares me to think of universities, colleges um, using a coefficient that rewards them for focusing on getting students to those higher dollar places that, that th those levels of inequality that are, that are harming us. And so I'm wondering um, about uh, maybe coming up with a coefficient that indicates how successful we are at getting, getting people to the middle class, 
for instance, as opposed to yes. So, so, so I mean, the, the, this is this is a, this is a, a, a fair point. I, I want to remind you of this top twenty percent. When it's said like this, looks like success, but in the end, it's a job. You know, paying sixty k or more. I see, or or one percent even. Yeah. Or... So, so top twenty percent, you know, looks like success, but when the Ameri Americans are thinking middle class. They almost always think, you know, about income levels that would be in the vicinity, you know, of the top 20%. That is, the true middle doesn't look like middle class. It looks too low income. So top 20%, think about it as, you know, a good foot into the middle class. Now, it's true that the top 1%, this time here we are talking about uh, true elite, but we could have done other numbers, and actually, if you go online, you can download all the statistics about how colleges protect you from being poor, you know, avoiding the bottom 20% or the bottom 40%. Uh, those numbers uh, are online, but it's, it's true that we didn't choose, uh, we, we chose not to emphasize those. We, to, just to show uh, success, because when we think American dream, uh, intergenerational mobility, the natural image that comes to mind is starting poor and achieving some measure of, uh, of success. Okay, and, and I was just curious how, if you could imagine how this discussion might be different if we were taxing the top end at 73% like you've suggested in the past. Uh, I mean, t t tax, taxing the top is a good way to, uh, to raise more revenue. Uh, you know, especially at a time where the top has a ton of, uh, of incomes and more revenue, I think, is important to improve uh, the quality of, uh, of, higher, of our higher education uh, uh, system. So it, it really, in terms of investment, that is things that the government can do with funds, I think higher education is a very, is a very good one because if you don't do it, the market is not going to do it for you, or if it does it for you, it's going to do it in a way you don't want, you know, like the for-profit uh, uh, for model. The Harvard and the Stanfords are not going to expand. They are what they are, you know, they keep their size constant, so it really needs to come from, uh, from the public sector. So it's not just spending, it's also the quality, you know, you want somehow to have good institutions. So there it's not just throwing dollars, but the dollars are, are important to start with, you know, to have more bandwidth in the, in the, in the good schools. Uh, first, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, this is a little bit of an unfair question because I saw that as you were going through your slides and watching your watch, you decided not to discuss a slide that had something about the mismatch theory. And I wonder if you could actually talk about that for a moment. Uh, we did have Carolyn Huxby as one of our earlier speakers, and I'm thinking that's connected. I'd be fascinated to see how this intersects with, with, with that work. Yes, so, so what I would say is that I, I, it's possible that she, pres that she, Karen Huxby did fascinating work. Uh, it's worth for the audience to know, uh, showing that uh, there are actually quite a few talented kids from low-income backgrounds that have high SAT scores and come from, say, bottom 20% uh, families. And when she looks at those kids, she finds that the type of schools they apply and go to are much worse than uh, their richer peers who have the same good SAT scores. That is, if you're rich and a good SAT score, you go to Stanford. If you are uh, poor, and you have a, a good SAT score, you typically go to the school nearest to you, so either a community college or a four-year uh, institution, even though, in reality, in the current system, if you are poor and talented, you can apply to Stanford, and you are going to uh, uh, be able to go, you know, fully funded. So she pointed out that, uh, uh, that inequality that, 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 that arises in part because low-income kids just don't understand very well. They, they are not able to navigate uh, 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 very well the higher education system. They think Stanford, that's too expensive for uh, our family, when in reality they would get, uh, they would get you know, uh, a fellowship. So she points out a, an important component 
of uh, uh, inequality, you know, of what generates inequality in the higher uh, education uh, system. Our, uh, the, I mean, our point here is very simple. It says that, uh, so Stanford does a lot, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to, to allow poor kids, talented, you know, to, to, to attend their school. What our statistics show is that those poor kids, talented, who go to Stanford, end up doing pretty well, almost as well as the rich kids. So in that sense, it's not like Stanford is taking in kids uh, that are not competent uh, to, to attend uh, uh, Stanford, which also means that perhaps there is scope uh, for those schools you know, to do uh, even more. So in terms of policy ideas, I don't think it's crazy to think that uh, the government could insist, you know, look, you are tax-free, you have this huge uh, endowment, and your endowment is going to be tax-free only if you meet certain criteria in terms of your student body composition showing that you contribute, say, to uh, uh, providing opportunity for low-income uh, uh, kids. Given the importance of universities in providing some hope for income mobility, then why do you think there's so much hostility right now um, toward the university system? Is it all the, the dots to the right that just aren't doing a very good job, or um, is there some scope for helping change that message? Uh, yeah, so, so, so that's a good and, and uh, important question. So I don't know that I have the silver bullet answer, but what I know is that uh, the equilibrium or the spiral we are in is, is a bad spiral to be in. That is, the, the, the public in California sees the tuition increases and gets upset. And they say, look, why pay you know, uh, uh, taxes if it's to then to have to foot an enormous tuition bill? So it gets them even angrier you know, at the university uh, a system, they pay fewer taxes, and as a result, you know, tuitions have uh, to increase. So we are in a really bad uh, 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 dynamic. And I think, you know, so that's why I think proposals that really say, look, in public uh, 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 higher uh, education institutions, tuition is going to be really low, like it was, you know, decades ago makes universities popular, public universities popular uh, with, the, uh, with the public. And I, th I really feel like it's uh, one of the best uses, you know, of tax, uh, of tax money. That is, I really think that uh, universities can improve uh, the level of education uh, of, the, of the community and providing it, uh, uh, you know, largely from the public, I think, is a, is a proven way, you know, to boost your uh, 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 higher education degree. That's how countries, you know, around the world have, have done it, you know, and that's how they've managed to push up their, uh, uh, their college uh, uh, attendance rate. Now, I'm a university professor, so I always argue, you know, for more money to, uh, uh, to universities. Um, hello. Uh, does, no. Okay, there you go. Hi. Um, so, very interesting presentation. Maris Rodriguez is also first gen, so I could identify with the 20%. Um, my question, though, is I critique the levels of wealth in the sense that a lot of first generation or people from the lower 20th quintile, um, they come with debt. And so it's like their wealth is actually negative deficit in the sense I'm wondering that even the outcomes of these students having like average of 60,000K, like does it really account into factor like how like the level of income from their parents actually factor in the actual, like, I guess, quality of life post-graduation, yes. in addition of, like, does it intersect, does, like, the wealth inequality or wealth gap with higher education intersect with, I guess, racial segregation or racial tension, such as the 20th percentile, the average for low-income folks in their savings for Caucasians is $1,000 in savings, or for Latin Americans, it's 600 or for African Americans, that's, tw like, $20, so it's, like, does it really critique the levels of wealth, whether it's positive or negative wealth, and how does that transcend into different yeah, demographics? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so to two, two very interesting aspects here. One other manifestation of the retrenchment 
of the state in providing funding you know, to uh, uh, higher education institutions by having, you know, instead of having low tuition, now we have high tuition and the students have to pay for it. And oftentimes, if they come indeed from low income backgrounds, the only way they can pay for it is through student uh, loans. Okay, so now, if, if you're an economist, a, a narrow-minded economist, like m most of us are, you, you, you think like student loans, that's a great way, you know, like you, you, you take a loan, you make an investment in higher education, and then you get a good job, and you repay it. So that's the, th the, the economic theory. In practice, we can see that it really doesn't work uh, like this, that is the student loans feel like a huge burden and a source of inequality, you know, like you, you, you are saddled with this huge debt. Uh, you are at risk, you know, of sometimes you don't have great jobs and you see that your more fortunate peers don't, don't have that. So I think it creates a huge uh, inequality that's really bad also for how the public is going to perceive uh, universities, because now if you have a huge student loan, you see, yeah, I got that great education, but I also got that huge burden that I need uh, to, to carry through. So I think student loans are an idea that works, uh, you know, for economists and for our models. Uh, it doesn't work for, for, for people. So that's why I also advocate, you know, more taxes, more direct funding, fewer student loans. It will put, you know, things on a more equal footing. It, it will have a, a much stronger sense of, uh, 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 of fairness. In terms of racial inequality, so we would have loved to break out, you know, those statistics by race. Unfortunately, with the tax data we are using, uh, there is no uh, information uh, on race. Now, Raj Chetty is doing uh, subsequent projects, you know, with census data that this time has race, unfortunately doesn't have college. So, you know, there's no, no current data set that gives you everything you need, but it's possible that down the road, you know, that might be feasible if those data sets somehow are merged so that it will be pretty fascinating, you know, to, to break those by, uh, 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 by race. Hi, uh, I was just kind of uh, curious to see what these statistics would look like if they were weighted uh, by the student population, just because if you have two universities with the same mobility rates, but one is 10 times as large, they might yes. be doing more to alleviate or improve uh, socioeconomic mobility. And I was thinking about this because there was a presentation a few years ago by John Baum that showed, I believe UC Davis had drastically increased its international student population in, in response to budget shortfalls. And I'm wondering, since all of this is tax data, I'm assuming international students aren't included in any of your statistics which means that you could have similar mobility rates and uh, shares of students from the bottom quintile, but the actual number is shrinking. So yes. that's kind of what you thought no, about that. No, the, yes, this is a, a, a very good uh, a, a question. So, so yes, in our data, we have the size you know, of the student body in, a, in, a, in, our, in our studies. So that typically, the, the good schools that, that push you, you know, toward high mobility rates for the top 20% tend to be pretty big. You know, they are big community colleges or big four-year schools. That's why the, that's where the numbers are. Now, our study is only for residents. That is, it excludes uh, foreign students because to be part of our study, we need to link you to parents. And in the case of foreign students, obviously there are no parents here in the US uh, that we link to. And foreign students, I think, are another manifestation of that privatization trend or ways for the universities, you know, to get more resources because the state is not uh, providing uh, resources. That is indeed the foreign students are attractive for the UCs because they pay uh, full tuition. So it is as if, you know, uh, they subsidize uh, 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 the rest uh, of the university. So in terms of politics perceptions, that's actually terrible because the public feels uh, we are paying high tuition and we are not getting uh, any slots because those slots are taken you know, by uh, foreigners. And that's why actually in the, in the negotiation of the state with UCs, 
a, re a big requirement that the state imposed is that a cap uh, on uh, actually foreign plus uh, non-state. You know, the foreigners are also people you know from uh, other uh, states that take. Our, so I think again, the, this way of setting up the debate uh, is a, is a lose lose situation for the state and for the universities. The way things should be presented is like this. Look, our universities have the ability to attract the best minds from other states, stealing you know, from Michigan, but also from China and everywhere. And those kids are going, and we are going to charge them a lot. And with that money, we'll open extra slots for the Californians. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's actually a huge resources, uh, uh, a, a re huge resource that California is so attractive. Uh, and it's a resource we should, uh, we should exploit instead of fighting, saying they are stealing uh, from us. So the state should give us, you know, more money. We expand the bandwidth and we charge lots of foreigners and everybody is happier except, you know, perhaps people in Michigan or in China, you know, if they are losing their, their best mind. But from a California perspective, it's a no-brainer that that's, uh, that's an opportunity. Is it inevitable that sticker price of college is going to keep increasing? It, it looks like we are in that dynamic, but I don't think it's a good thing. And uh, I hope, you know, we get... Uh, uh, future governors, you know, who are going to be willing to uh, see things, uh, 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 see things differently and think, you know, more creatively that we have a great uh, resources in our universities and we are going to use it and expand it. But currently, you're right, that is, we are stuck in that debate where fewer resources and, we, and as a result, universities increase tuition. So maybe we can save a little bit here and there, you know, more transfers, online courses, but that's really very small things. They, they, well, well, we could do, you know, successful big uh, 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 things. Unfortunately, my view is that uh, Governor Brown was about making small savings where he could uh, and not being uh, visionary and ambitious enough. Like his, his father, uh, you, know, de you know, designed a master a plan, and that was a tremendous success, you know, for California. And I think we need a, re, a, a, a reset, you know, of the master plan where you need, California decides we are going to put resources into higher education because it's good for educating our population, attracting, you know, the best minds uh, from elsewhere, and we have uh, the resources to pay for it, and it will pay dividends down the roads, you know, with people making making more uh, money. All right, we have time for one last question. What an honor to get the last question. <laughs> um, I had a question about your, your variables. You use household income as opposed to individual earners, and I know you've looked at um, the effect that male, female gender has, and so my question is getting at how might marriage be masking the effects? Are people just coming to college, staying, meeting folks, marrying, and marrying well? Yes, yeah, so, so that might have been the case, you know, decades ago. Uh, Right now, we've also done uh, numbers, you know, instead of using your own individual earnings as a young adult, looking at your family earnings, that is your earnings plus those of your spouses, it doesn't uh, change that much uh, the picture because uh, now in the United States, actually labor force participation of those uh, younger women is actually, is actually quite high. So the, the gender effect, is much less uh, uh, than, uh, than it was. But you're right, that is, if we had done that study, if the data had been there in the 60s, that would have been a critically uh, important factor to, uh, to take into account. Well, with that, Emmanuel's gonna join us for uh, refreshments out on the patio if you didn't get your question answered. And, and one last time, we wanna thank you and- uh, Thank you.